Today's task is to install operating system and provision those laptops to prepare them for the classes for the next semester. Hi, I'm DC Techie and I like IT stuff. You will need those three servers. In my case, all of them are installed together with the DHCP server on a single VM. This won't be a tutorial on how to install the DHCP or HTTP server. That may come someday, but for today I will only show you the relevant config snippets. The method I'm showing here only works for Ubuntu, and to be precise, I think only for Ubuntu newer than 20.04. Every major distro has their own auto-installation method, like Red Hat has Kickstart, Debian has Preseed, and Ubuntu has Cloud Init or um, Auto-Install. Also, Ubuntu dropped the Debian Preseed in 2004. The DHCP configuration is pretty easy. I'm defining three things here. Boot file for legacy boot, EFI binary for UEFI, and finally configuration file for IPXE binary. But notice that this is a chain of if commands, which means that if your networking card already has some version of IPXE installed, then it will go straight for the config file. Okay, the sun has gone over my window finally, so um, anyway, what is IPXE? So IPXE is an open source boot manager, and it has many use cases, but for now we'll mostly focus on network boot. I would highly suggest you compile your own version. Default releases don't really have all of the features included, and depending on what do you want to achieve, you might want to uncheck some features and have them compiled into the binary. I would assume that the smallest version of the binary possible is due to the fact that you are able to install the IPXC onto some network interface cards, and they might have some limitations as to how big their EPROM memory is. So you can't really have everything everywhere all at once. Grab the source code and enter the SRC directory. Most of the basic configuration options are in the config slash general dot h. But I wouldn't touch it and modify anything if you are doing this for the first time just to have a working proof of concept. It's best to specify make targets, since by default you'll end up with lots of binaries you won't be using. In my case, it's enough if you specify those two. Next, I'm copying those files to my SRV slash TFTP directory. Many options can be hard-coded into the IPXE binary, but I want as much flexibility as possible, so we'll be using the chain load feature. And for that, as i shown before, the DHCP server is pointing the IPXE to the TXT file located on the HTTP server, which contains the necessary configuration for IPXE to boot other entries. I'm defining a menu with some boot options. Local system boot, some Debian, Ubuntu Live ISO, and finally the Ubuntu auto install. The local system boot basically quits the IPXE and the system continues the startup process with the next booting option. If you want to replicate this, try not to make any typos and copy all of the arguments you see on the screen. Also, there are two important things to notice here. First is that I am not pointing the auto-install to the specific YAML file, only to a directory located on the HTTP server. And secondly, for the auto-install, I am using a server install image. The reason is very simple. The server image uses way less RAM. Okay, now we can finally check out the auto-install directory in configs. But before that, you might ask yourself, why use both TFTP and HTTP servers? Couldn't everything be done from a single one? Well, I had the idea of using just the TFTP since it's like a very small, reliable version of a transfer protocol that's basically supported everywhere out of the box, especially in IPXE. But I ran into some weird issue with the UEFI firmware on the laptops I'm provisioning the lab for. Basically, when it came to the ISO downloading process, the transfer speeds were very, very slow. And I think maybe the issue is with the networking stack because by default the TFTP uses UDP packets. I think the UEFI firmware had some issues with that. And if I switch to HTTP, everything worked just fine. The transfer speeds were satisfactory and everything just worked well. And this is why I am using both TFTP and HTTP server. You might be all right if you just do TFTP, but I would rather make this guide a bit more comprehensive, just in case you will need both of those. 
Anyway, my auto install directory has three files. The metadata, vendor data and user data. I will be storing all of my configuration in the user-data file, but I did notice that auto-install sends get requests for all of those three files. So I would rather just have them sit there empty rather than uh, HTTP server send back the 404 not found error. Also, it is very important that all of those files start with hashtag cloud-config. If this is not the first line in a file, the auto-install completely ignores the file contents. Anyway, let's inspect the user data file. Within user data section, I am defining a single user, what group he belongs to, default shell, SSH key for remote login, and passwordless sudo. You might have seen some tutorials where the user-data is not used for it, and instead everything is defined in identity section. It is imperative you use the user-data if you want to also preserve the DHCP assigned hostname as the actual hostname for the machine. This is very weird, but I haven't found any other solution for this. Especially since I'm provisioning multiple devices, I would rather have them have unique hostnames since the very beginning. Next, some basic settings like system locale, keyboard layout and time zone. SSH has its own dedicated section. I want the SSH server and for testing, I left the allow password option set to true. Now for storage. This is overall poorly documented, but if you don't really want to partition your system too specifically, the default options and templates are very good and simplify the process uh, significantly. In my case, laptops have two drives, one SSD and one HDD. I want my system installed on SSDs, so I'm giving the option to look for the smallest drives possible, which is also an SSD. You can use both smallest and largest modificators as you please. I have also picked LVM to be provisioned on the drives. This allows me some field of maneuver if I want to change anything later down the line after the system has been installed and provisioned. Ubuntu's auto install has some built-in templates and it will try to partition and size the volumes according to it. Here's the table. I like the default partitioning templates provided by Ubuntu and I can change anything later as needed since I picked the LVM provisioning option. By the way, when I was testing this on Proxmox I had to set the disk type to emulate SSDs in order for auto install to detect it as such. Next I'm changing the default apt repositories for something more local. As for packages, since I'm using server ISO I need to install Ubuntu desktop and some additional ones. The shutdown option defines how the installer will behave after finishing. And the late command here section is for a bit of magic I found on Stack Overflow, which configures the DHCP assigned name and hostname of the system. I'll say this once again. This only works if you have defined your user in user-data section and not the identity section. Also, you cannot use both of those sections at once. If you're interested, all of the syntax and options are defined here in this link, which will also be in the video description. I have to say that sadly not everything is described there, especially if you want to delve deeper into partitioning, but for basic usage it's enough. And that's pretty much it. If you haven't made any typos or errors, everything should proceed flawlessly with zero input from your side. I will be doing some additional configuration with Ansible, since it's better documented for some edge cases I want to install and specific uh, domain software that needs to be on those laptops. I will make a GitHub repository with all of the text I've shown here, just so you don't have to type everything by hand. And with that, like, subscribe, and I hope I'll see you next time.